Okay, great. Uh, welcome, welcome back, everyone. So um, we're really happy to have Sebastian Mizera from the IAS. Uh, he will tell us about from modelized space localization to ADS amplitudes. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. As I was just saying, uh, it seems like a great workshop. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to watch all of the talks because of the uh, time zones, but. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm watching them online and I'm looking forward to the ones tomorrow as well. So today I will be talking about uh, a subject that has been developing for, for a while now, but the, uh, the specific uh, subject of this talk will be based on these four papers which appeared uh, more or less within the last year or so. So the first paper is, uh, contains all the background, it's, it's my thesis from around a year ago. Then the second paper, uh, out of which we'll use Appendix A, uh, was written together with Andrzej Pokraka from McGill, uh, and he will be talking about a uh, gross Monday limit. The third paper focuses on the connections to color kinematics duality. It's a short letter. And then finally, uh, towards the end of the talk, I will move to discussion of ADS uh, amplitudes, which is based on this recent a uh, preprint that we just posted together with uh, my collaborators from the IES, Lawrence Eberhard and Shota Komatsu. Okay, very good. So let's start by asking uh, the question, well, the title was from the mo modular space localization to ADS amplitudes, and what do I mean by the word localization in this context? Well, what do I mean is that, uh, is that if we want to com compute some observable in, uh, in quantum field theory, or in string theory, what we would do is we would start with some uh, path integral, or oh, apologies, with some path integral, uh, which as usual is a path of uh, integral over all fields. So famously, it's an infinite dimensional integral. However, we know that if we consider some special classes of theories, most notably uh, free theories, so this could be a free theory living on the string wall sheet or a free theory living on the word line, uh, that infinite dimensional integral collapses to an integral over a finite number of geometric parameters. So I will call this uh, integral modular space integral, uh, since those parameters are usually referred to as the moduli of your theory. And that is crucially a finite dimensional integral. So something that is now tractable, something that you can do. So the intuition that you, have, you can have is that uh, if we have some word line that the, the parameters that you have to integrate over are these proper times or Schwinger parameters of the, of the word line. Or if we consider string theory, you would have integrals over moduli of your Riemann surface, such as tau, and the positions of the vertex operators, such as z in here. Okay, but now it turns out that you can do even better than that. In, for special classes of uh, theories, uh, there's an additional phenomenon which I will refer to as moduli space localization, in which uh, even this finite dimensional integral reduces even more, and it re reduces to something that can be written as a finite sum. Okay, so here the range of the sum is, is, is uh, uh, finite, and of course, we can think of it as a zero dimensional integral. So just the original integral localized on points. So you see that we've come, we've came a long way from a path integral to a modular space integral to a localized integral. And something that is special about it is that it allowed us to go from infinite dimensions to zero dimensions. So obviously that's uh, important for two reasons. First reason is purely practical because now we can compute things easier on a, uh, in an easier way than we could before. And the other one is theoretical. Clearly, there's something special about these kind of uh, localizations, and we would like to understand what and to what extent they generalize to other theories. So the, the goal of, of this talk is to review three cases uh, where this model space localization appears in the S matrix theory. So over the last year or so, we've seen that uh, uh, this, this kind of structure seems to extend to many contexts. I have, I'm not going to cover all of them. I will just focus on three special ones, okay? So uh, a disclaimer straight away is that I will, for the purposes of this talk, I will um, uh, employ this couple of simplifications. So the first one is that everything will be four point, everything will be three level, and all the particles will be massless. 
So this is uh, the reason why I want to do, um, to do it is that I have only a limited uh, amount of time and I wanted to fo illustrate the points of localization in the minimal setting possible. And uh, uh, everything that I will say generalizes to higher point. Some of the things that I will say generalize to massive particles and even fewer things of what I'm going to say generalize to loop level. So feel free to ask me at any stage if you're curious about what thing generalizes and what doesn't. Uh, and I should say also feel free to ask me any other questions that you might have. Although if you have a longer discussion in mind, as you can see here, I prepared around 16 slides, so I might run out of time. So uh, longer discussion, let's keep it um, until the end. Very good. So now here's the plan of the talk. So I promised you that I will review three cases. So here's the first one. The first one will be uh, that of string theory scattering in Minkowski space. So this is a picture of Minkowski space and some string wall sheet. So uh, that will be just a review of a long story that dates back to Farley and Roberts in the 70s, although nowadays is mostly now attributed to Gross and Mende, who studied string perturbation theory uh, in high energy limit. Okay, and they found that in this high energy limit, the string wall sheet localizes on the solutions of these kind of uh, saddle point equations where P's are the momenta and Z's are positions on a, on a puncture sphere. Okay, so that would be just a review, but we'll clarify some of the points and um, illustrate the, the main techniques. Uh, after doing so, we'll move on to a flat space as matrix. So we, we still are in Minkowski space, but now we're doing quantum field theory. So we'll be QFT specifically. And there's an interesting f um, phenomenon here discovered by uh, Kachazo song uh, who's one of the organizers, and Elise Yuan, who will be talking uh, tomorrow, uh, who found that a similar type of equations appear in uh, QFT as matrix, okay? And one of the points that I wanted to emphasize here is that even though these two equations, they might look identical the way that they are written here, they're actually completely different. And the reason why they look identical the way they're written here is that they're written in local coordinates, okay? There will be some topological distinctions that you have to take into account, uh, but, uh, but they're not easily seen from here. So one of the things that I wanted to emphasize is, is compare that set of equations to that set of equations. And one thing, one feature that we'll see is that the first one generically has an infinite number of solutions, while the second one uh, in this four point case has only one. Okay, so as a matter of fact, that's the reason why uh, this, this, this CHY set of equations will have a dual map to Feynman diagrams, something that Grossman that doesn't have. Okay, that's a direct relationship. And it also shows you that the flat space S matrix has two distinct way of uh, seeing modular space localization. Okay, finally, once we understand, it will be crucial to understand this relationship. And once we do understand this, we'll be able to generalize our, um, our, uh, adventures to uh, ADS, okay? So it will be a very similar story, also concerning quantum field free, but now in curved background, and you will be in ADS. So we'll be studying this kind of ADS amplitudes or CFT correlators. And what we will find is that things localize on a very similar set of equations, where this, uh, I will explain later on what this D means. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of an operator valued version of, of these constraints from before. And as before, we'll see that there's two different ways of localizing. One is on these kind of constraints, and the other one is on within diagrams. So that's something that we've, uh, we've uh, described with uh, Eberhard and Komatsu, and also there's a very similar, although slightly different, these variables have slightly different meaning, there's a very similar setup by uh, Rurik and Skinner in a paper that appeared on the same day as this one. Okay, so are there any questions at this stage? If not, then let me just move on. Okay, so we're going to start with the with revisiting the result of Gross Mende. So that's that's going to be based on the appendix A of this paper that I mentioned before. 
Okay, so here's remind everyone about string basic facts about string perturbation theory. I'm going to consider scattering of open strings. Uh, I will attach a momentum to each um, to each particle, and I will reverse the outgoing momenta such that everyone is going in. In that way, the momentum conservation can be written in an easy way by just a sum over everyone adding up to zero. Then, as usual, we map all the states to operators. So what we end up with is some upper half plane with insertions of vertex operators on the boundary. Then, using the sl 2 freedom, we can fix positions of the three vertex, vertex operators by convention the first one, second last, and the last one to zero, one, and infinity. Okay, what this leaves us with is uh, is just uh, the remaining moduli space, which is now parameterized by a single parameter, which is this x2, the, the only remaining unfixed factor. Okay, so uh, that, that moduli space would typically be called MO4, so O stands for genus 0, 4 for four functors, and R for the fact that everyone is confined to a real axis. Okay, then for example, if you wanted to compute a four-point amplitude, this is how you would do it. So four-point amplitude would be given by integration over, over this x2. And let me integrate it just between, in this chat, this specific chan pattern ordering, that would be an integral between uh, zero and one, like here, okay? Then the integrand splits into two natural parts, one which comes from the uh, OPEs of the um, plane waves, is, uh, is this factor, which typically is called the Koba-Nielsen factor. And because it just comes from the plane wave contractions, it's completely universal to any type of string theory. So it doesn't matter if it's bosonic, uh, if, it's, if it's type one or whatever, uh, it's always this. So it has an alpha prime, the Mandelstam parameters S and T, and these, these factors of log mod modulus of X2 and one minus X2. So these log uh, modulus are a consequence of the fact that the Green's function on the boundary of the worksheet looks like log mod. Okay, then we'll, what we'll do is we'll just shove, shove um, um, all the um, all the dependence on the matter content and so on to uh, the remainder of the integral. So the, that remainder will be just some uh, dx2 form. It's going to depend on the specific matter content. So things like what you put in your vertex operators, what is, uh, uh, what is the specific action and so on, it will be all here. But for us, for the purposes of studying localization, it will be completely irrelevant. So we could just uh, study some toy model here and it's not going to change the result. Very good. So for example, if we wanted to study something like a Veneziano amplitude, we could take this combination. I mean, why not? So this is just dx2 with something that has poles at zero, 0 and 1. And if you do it, and if you just plug it in to just rem remind you or flash you how typical result would look like, you would have some gamma functions of alpha prime s, alpha prime t, and the sum of alpha prime s and alpha prime t. Okay, so that's a typical looking Veneziano amplitude. And now, uh, oh, before, before going, Further, let me just recall, uh, also remind you what the, the, the S variable is just defined as this total energy. Uh, T is the transfer energy and U is the transfer energy in the other channel. And then S plus T plus U usually end up to a sum of masses squared. But for us, everyone, everyone will be massless, so that is just zero. So throughout the talk, I will, whenever there appears U, I will plug in minus S minus T by this momentum conservation constraint. And then if you work out what the scattering angle is, so scattering angle phi would be related to the, um, to the Mandelstam variables in this way, okay? And that's important because what we want to consider is now the fixed angle high energy limit. So if we want to fix the, keep the angle fixed, what we need to do is keep the ratio basically between S and T to be fixed. So that's what, what we're going to do. And here I just multiplied it by alpha prime so in that way, we, the only thing that we have to do to study this fixed angle high energy limit is just take the alpha prime to infinity. It doesn't change the angle, but, but takes the energy to, to infinity. Okay, so far so good. So now, now let's see what happens. 
So what I'm plotting here is the s-axis and the t-axis. And there's also u, which is equal to minus s minus t. So that's u equals zero. And if we look at the typical amplitude, such as this one coming from uh, something like Benetian, no, it has infinite number of poles, okay? And poles here are uh, represented in red, okay? So we have pole at s equals zero, pole at s equals to minus one over alpha prime, minus two over alpha prime, and so on. And there's an infinite tower of poles going in this direction. And also there's an infinite number tower of poles going in the, uh, in the t-channel, okay? So now uh, one thing uh, to emphasize is that the, there's only one physical region for a specific process in this plane. That would be called the physical region. And in the signature that I'm using here, which is mostly plus, that means that uh, I have to keep my energy to be negative. So S is negative and T and U being positive. If you work out what this is, we're talking about this region. Okay, and here's the crucial point. If I wanted to study asymptotics, so studying asymptotics means that I keep the ratio of S and T to be fixed. So basically it, con it, um, it uh, corresponds to one of these lines. So I pick uh, some direction and I go in this direction to infinity. You see that if I, if I go say in this direction, it's quantitatively different to going in any other one. So if I keep S and T to be positive, and keep going here, what's going to happen is that asymptotics will encounter exactly zero singularities. And that's qualitatively different to going in, say, in this direction, in which on the way, you will encounter this one, this one, that, and so on, and in, there will be infinite number of singularities. So clearly, asymptotics depends on which direction in the, uh, in the angle you're looking at. And that's a well-known phenomenon. This, this feature is called the Stokes phenomenon. Okay, the fact that the, fact that the, the asymptotic, asymptotics of a, of a function depends on the range of parameters that you uh, are in. And we would like to understand the Stokes phenomenon from the worksheet perspective. So I wanted to go in, into some details uh, behind that because it's not usually considered in the books, okay? So what we want to do is we want to employ the saddle point approximation. So we look at the one of these integrals, such as this one, let's say alpha prime only appears here. Then what, what we want to do to localize this integral is take alpha prime to, to infinity and analyze the saddle point of this function. Okay, so saddle point naively, very naively, would be just uh, taking the uh, place where the first derivative of this function and vanishes, okay? So if you just work it out, there's a del hitting log, so we get something like this, and we set that to zero. Now you can solve for that, uh, you can solve for that equation. So the solution to that equation will be, there's only one, and it's very simple, basically that, that the position of the saddle is S divided by S plus T. And here I just rewrote it by momentum conservation in, in different way for convenience. So now let's look uh, at what happens in, the, in our integration domain. So remember that in our original integral, if we just scroll up here, we are integrating between zero and one, which was a consequence of the fact that the function two is between one and three, okay? So the integration domain is, is this one, between zero and one in our moduli space of X2. And now you see what happens. What happens is that if we're in some safe region in the kinematic space, such as when both S and T are positive, then this, the saddle passes through the integration contour and we can just localize on it because there's a saddle on the, on the contour. But now let's see what happens when uh, in the physical region, so this is the, this is the physical region, uh, there we had an S negative and T and U positive. So it's in interesting to look at this representation of the cell. So we have one plus positive divided by positive, and that tells us that the cell point has to be somewhere between one and infinity. And that, that is a problem. And that's a problem because you might be confused what's going on. 
we have some integral and we have some sal that lies away from it, how do we ever localize in the high energy limit? Okay. And the, so what's going on? And the, what's going on is that really we're too cavalier with just applying saddle point approximation without understanding of where it comes from. Okay. So to do it correctly, what we need to do is uh, we first need to write um, the integrand as a holomorphic function. Okay. That writing it as a holomorphic function will allow us to employ all the apparatus of complex analysis, the form contours, et, et cetera. So essentially what it boils down to is taking this factor of log mod x2 and replacing it with something like log z, where z is a complex variable. And we'll do it in such a way that along the contour, the original contour that we integrate over, these two functions agree, so we get the same integral. Okay? So let's do it. And we do the same thing for log one minus X two mod would be log one minus Z. Okay. So uh, let's do it. And uh, doing so will, um, will meet a consequence. And the consequence is that uh, once, we, once we make the integral holomorphic, sorry, the integrand holomorphic, suddenly it, it has uh, infinite number of branches, okay? It has infinite number of branches simply because of the fact that log, this log and this log have uh, just every branch cut and we can go on different branches uh, up and down in the sort of usual car park picture of the branch cut, okay? So our integral looks like now like this, where this is some branched function and this is some DZ form which will assume remains um, single value. Okay, so uh, that space has a name. So this multi-branch surface is M tilde, uh, which is called the maximal abelian cover of the original uh, space, okay? So the way that it looks like is that if we plot the original Z um, space, and then we have the, our integration contour between zero and one, then, uh, after holomorphizing the integral integrand, uh, we have this branch cut from log z, which will be extending from zero to infinity. I sort of displaced it to make it easier to read. It's from zero to infinity. And also there's a branch cut going from one to infinity from the other log. Okay. So now what happens is that uh, we can go around these branch cuts and we would go on different sheets and we can do it around zero and around one, and there will be different counting of the sheets. So let's say we go P times, so P could be a positive or negative integer, around zero and Q times around the other branch cut. Okay, so that tells us that the sheet structure of our um, integrand is parameterized by a lattice of points, P and Q, which are integers. So every sheet is, is uh, parameterized by, by uh, one pair of integers. And moreover, there will be these critical points and these critical points, uh, there will be one per each sheet. They basically lie on top of each other. And that's the fact that we, that's the thing that we didn't see before because everything was sort of squashed into a single sheet. So you see now there's a hope because now we have a bigger space, so we can start deforming this, this contour and hope to pass through the, through, the, uh, through the saddle points. But of course, the, the problem is now that this lattice is infinite, so also the number of saddle points is infinite. Okay, but before doing so, let's make it, uh, maybe I should stop. Are there, are, are there any questions at this stage? Is this clear? I'll wait a bit. Sorry, can you remind me what is the critical point? This is not the saddle point, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I use the word critical point and the saddle point interchangeably. So it turns out if, if the function is holomorphic, if the function is holomorphic, critical points always have index one, which means that they're always saddles. Uh, that's and a consequence of Cauchy Yeah. Sorry, uh, do, do, you, do you impose like the phi is a d log form or anything like that? 
five no five i will just impose that it doesn't have any bran additional branch cuts so it's just some form and if you do i mean you know very well that if we do just string perturbation theory this will be some rational rational um, form okay it depends on alpha prime it, it can depend on alpha prime in a more complicated situation in which case you would have to take the limit here as well okay um, okay but that's the only thing that changes Yep. Sorry about that last comment. So do, we know that in flat space, but what you're referring to is in flat space, we know that that factor will not have any uh, additional, say, monodromies. But yep. is it true in general if I'm considering non-trivial backgrounds? Uh, it, will, it will not be true in general, uh, but I will not consider these situations. In fact, it would be interesting to see what, yeah, what is the branch structure depending on what background you consider. Uh, um, uh, um, yeah. So yeah, the assumption, maybe I should have spelled it out, is that this, this is single value. Okay. All good? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, to make, I'm just gonna move on. If you have any other questions, please ask. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I wanted to see this in an easier way. It's sort of difficult to take care of all these branches. So I'm going to straighten out the, the whole integration space. Uh, so in order to see this more clearly, uh, all I'm going to do is do a simple change of variables. Okay. So what I'm going to do is do this um, change of variables around the z going to zero with this exponential map. So u is basically the thing that goes around um, uh, here. And similarly, there will be a similar change of variables around uh, z going to one. I will apply another exponential map with a new var variable v. Sorry, I should have said this u is a new var. It doesn't have anything to do with one this time. It's a, it's a new variable, u and v. But at the same time, we know that they're not independent. So of course, this variable is z. This is one minus z. So they have to adapt to one. So I need to change this variable on the support of this constraint. Okay, so that's that's what I'm going to do. So if you if you just do it carefully, you can you can trust me that um, if you look at the previous integral and then just up, do this do this change of variables and you're careful with all the Jacobians and so on, what we end up with is the integral in some in some variables u, v, and w. Here we have the this Cobanisen factor um, in. Um, in which we have alpha prime s u so u used to be log z and then t times v v used to be log one minus z and also we apply we we integrate over additional lagrange multiplier w which is going to just impose this constraint that they're related to each other okay and i think uh, this was for the simplifying case um well where phi was this form You can, of course, do more complicated cases, but you will just clutter the notation and won't teach us anything. Okay, so very good. So um, 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 also to, to um, later on, I will call this whole function because it's sort of difficult to write. I will just refer to it as capital W, okay? And what we can do now is look at this cell point. Now everything is legal because now everything is, um, uh, holomorphic, so I can just apply my cell point uh, approximation. And if you just vary this this action, if you vary this w, what you find is that from varying u, v, and w, you get these constraints. So of course the last one is trivial because it's just the Lagrange multiplier. So what we're interested in is um, is solving the first two. And if you just do it, it's a simple set of equations. You find the following that the cell points u, v, and w star are given by, by these, these answers. So that, far, that part is, is what you expected. So u is going to be log of s uh, divided by s plus t, which is um, mapping us to the previous case. But there will be this, this, this factor of 2 pi i times p, where p is some integer, as well as 2 pi i q, where q is another integer which enter now in counting which specific cell point you were talking about. So you see that the after, if we apply this map back, so if we apply this map here and here in the reverse direction, 
these ex these tupai ip and tupai iq would disappear because they they enter the exponentials okay so that tells you that the dependence on this lattice points disappears after after taking this reverse change of variables so that's the way that you would see that all these infinite number of subtle points which really sit on top of each other they would get squashed in the previous variables and that's why it was sort of a bit misleading to write it um, in the z variables in the first place okay so now um, we can move on to the asymptotics let me just remind you that asymptotics is uh, is governed by these so-called Lefschetz symbols oops Lefschetz symbols and Lefschetz symbols are basically paths of the steepest descent so the, this will be j, called j and steepest ascent k of this uh, real value of my function extending through each, from each saddle point so the picture is as follows so here in this on this axis i have some real some real z and real sorry imaginary z and on the on the this axis i have the real value of my potential w so of, of this function and what i'm plotting here is just the shape of this function and i know that this function has some subtle points so here's the illustration of a subtle point and we're just doing this uh, cartoon picture locally so it doesn't matter you know it could be one of these p and q saddles and out of the saddle there would be two directions two unique directions in this case in which one goes uh, maximally downwards so that will be called j from a specific pq saddle and one that goes maximally upwards from from the same saddle so what uh, what traditional asymptotic analysis tells us is that all we have to do to analyze asymptotics is write our original integral our original veneziano amplitude as some linear combination of this steepest descent integrals okay so that's the j's basically these are the ones um, where the integral converges in the in the fastest way okay so once we once we project it to as once we write it as a linear combination of these integrals we know that everything converges and all you have to do is just read off the coefficients. And these coefficients turn out to be intersection numbers of the original contour gamma. So gamma, maybe I glossed over this, gamma was some original contour that we started with. And then in order to project it to Lefschetz symbols, we have to compute the intersection number with this k cycle. Okay. These intersection numbers are just counting. If you draw one contour and another, you just count how many times they intersect. Uh, so that number is always an integer, and it tells you that um, that um, that the asymptotics is given by this lattice sum over integers with these functions. Very good. So now, sorry, this this was this is actually an exact statement. You can always do it and only after that you can take the asymptotics so the point is that the asymptotics is is uh, now very easy for this kind of integrals because they already pass through every single saddle point so you can easily localize each of them and it gives us the standard factor of exponential exponential suppression in the in the energies okay so that's the universal suppression but we will also have this additional factor which basically comes from this infinite from the sum over infinite number of cells weighted with the phases that we that we ignored here okay so to summarize we have the infinite suppress sorry we have exponential suppression weighted with these factors which in principle could have infinite number of terms and these these factors will depend uh, on the specific direction in the st plane or the specific angle that we take so if for example if we took the s and t to be positive this factor would be just one and that reflects the fact that the original um, contour was already passing through the saddle 
so we wouldn't have to do any work. But if we want to go analyze asymptotics in the physical region, we'd have to make these corrections. Okay, so let's see how it goes. Actually, what I'm going to do is just quote the results. Um, it's a bit of a pain to derive it, but um, here's the result. So in the physical region, what it turns out is that it gives us a sum over infinite number of cells. So while in this region, there would be only one cell contributing in this region, in the physical region, there would be infinite number of cells. And the answer is this. So it turns out that this infinite number of cells, there is some, and you can write it, write this factor of F from here concisely as this factor. Very good. So let's make some sanity check. One is look at the um, poles of this, of this factor. And when S is negative, this factor has only poles at S equals to zero, minus one over a half, minus two over, sorry, minus one over alpha prime, minus two over alpha prime, and so on. And that exactly matches what we, what we might have expected. So from this original picture, we might have expected that in this physical region, there will be this infinite number of, um, of resonances that will still be, have to seen, be seen by the asymptotics. And that's indeed what happens. Okay, so that's the correction to the, to the famous Grassmann result. Okay, and um, I, want, I just wanted to mention that the way that such results can be obtained easily, so instead of summing over infinite number of cell points, what you can do is mm, learn this twisted homology theory, uh, something that we've been exploring for some time now, uh, which is a theory that packages the information of all branches at once and allows you to, the, to derive such results um, in a much simpler manner all at once. But unfortunately, because of the time, uh, I'm already running um, uh, late. So let me, let me just move on. Okay, are there any questions? I'm going to move on to the second part of the talk. So any questions about the first part? Sebastian, so if you go to a higher point, is it true yeah. that there are infinite many settled points on top of each solution to the scattering equation? Yes. Or you only choose, uh, there, there are, okay. But, but we, I, I should say that we don't know specifically how many, like what's the size of the lattice. Basically. But does, does this twisted homology theory tell you the answer without explicitly summing over them or it, explicitly yes. only yes. about the first full point? Uh, yeah, so it's right that the explicit, the explicit example was worked out only at four points. But in print, yeah, that's why I wanted to mention it, that if you wanted to do it at five points, the way I would use it, do it is using this twisted homology, because there is this number just comes out at once, and that's the, the twisted intersection number. So if you, if you match it, this should be some sines and cosines and stuff like this. Um, so that's the way you would, uh, th that's the way that I would try at, attempt to do it at higher points as well. Okay. I see. Uh, yeah. Yep. Thank you. I see uh, Karen raised her hand. Can, can, can you just ask the question? Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear about how you're computing uh, J with gamma, like those functions J and K, yep. which you have. So how yep. are they determined uh, in principle? Like uh, everything before that is sort of clear. Like mm -hmm. we have, we first, uh, we first, we first have to make sure that it's holomorphic. Then we need to consider these change of variables and we have these constraints. Yep. Uh, there is some contour gamma and then uh, this K and J, the steepest ascent and descent. Yep. Uh, are they uniquely determined or are there different prescriptions for them? Um, so, uh, yes. So very good. So um, these, um, these J and K are basically the, um, the, Paths along which the phase is stationary, so that's why it's called stationary phase approximation. And also, the additional constraint that you want to impose is that if you plot this function real valued of of your 
potential W, then you want to start with the cell point and you can write the differential equations for the how fast the um, these J and K paths would be solutions of those equations which tell you along which uh, path does the uh, this W decrease most rapidly or increase most rapidly away from the cell point. So it turns out if you do it for um, the, the, the answer in one dimension, in one complex dimension, the answer would be unique. In higher dimensions, it might not be unique. So meaning that this J could be, maybe there's some family of J's that you can consider, but any of them would be as good as any other for the purposes of asymptotics. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So if you want to learn more about it, uh, there's um, there's a there's a nice paper of uh, Edward Witten on um, analytic continuation of transignments theory where he describes the key reviews these these kind of arguments. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so let's change the topics. Right, so let me let me look at the Veneziano amplitude that we had before. Okay, so the rough, um, the way that it was written is some kind of integral between zero and one with this uh, e to the alpha prime times the, the action uh, of some differential form. Okay, so this w could have been something like alpha prime, s log z and so on. And now I wanted to ask a question, what happens if I just take the same integral, but add the total derivative, okay? So I'm just going to add the D of something such that the boundary terms don't contribute. So that's an equality because the, the answer doesn't change, that's just adding zero. But it's adding zero in an interesting way. So let me, let me now, what I'm going to do in the next equality is I'm going to hit this D First, <coughs> sorry. What I'm going to do is hit this D first on the Xi, some, some variable Xi that I had here. So I obtain this term. And also I, I can hit D on the exponential, which will bring out one factor of alpha prime times DW. Okay, times, times, times my Xi. So that's interesting because it tells me that I can Equal, equivalently well, I can consider my differential form phi, or I can consider this differential form phi shifted by this kind of term, and the answer won't change. So it's some kind of an equivalence class of things that I can integrate on the world sheet. So the way I wanted to, since this combination will appear a couple of times in this talk, let me just denote it as some covariant derivative, uh, nabla, hitting psi where this covariant derivative is the usual differential twisted by this one form, okay? Alpha prime times dw, where w was given here, okay? So what this means is that these, these, these equivalence relations, so phi as well as phi plus anything of this total derivative type, they define a cohomology class or just equivalence class. And now we can ask a mathematical question about what kind of invariants can be, you can compute with this kind of cohomology classes. So if you ask a mathematician about this, they will give you first these two answers. Well, one is, one is what we've already seen. Well, what we can do is we can just take my differential form and hit it with this exponential and integrate over some contour just like we did here for some specific contour. And that's one type of integral. And obviously that's the class of integrals that appears in open string amplitudes, such as the Veneziano that we've just seen. Another thing that you can do is you can take two of such forms, one holomorphic and one anti-holomorphic, and then put the discovenusian factors mod squared and that will give you another class of integrals where now instead of integrating over contour, you integrate over the full space, over the full moduli space. 
And obviously that's the type of integrals that appears in closed string perturbation theory at genus zero. So it also has some physical meaning. So now you can keep asking your mathematician friends, what kind of other integrals can you compute? Maybe they have some interesting physical meaning. So recently we've learned that there is, exists a third option of what kind of class of integrals that you can compute on these modelized spaces. And these are called intersection numbers. So these are intersection numbers of differential forms. So please do not confuse it with the types of things that we talked um, a couple of minutes ago. The way it's going to work is that um, I'm going to just pair up two differential forms, okay? So two, because one of them will be belonging to the original class that we just described. So phi plus would be equivalent to phi plus plus this nabla hitting psi. But also I will in introduce phi minus, so another guy, where the only difference is that the twisting will be negative compared to the, compared to the original one but both forms will remain holomorphic, okay? So now um, all you have to do to compute the intersection of these two differential forms is just wedge them together and integrate over the full mod light space. And uh, one thing that we've learned is that while the first two class of integrals, that they give you something that you might expect to come from string perturbation theory, this kind of integral is something that you will get from a quantum field theory. So it will be qualitatively different. And it gives you some kind of a new representation of the uh, QFT as matrix, at least at tree level. Okay, let me- uh, Sorry, let me... Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, my question is, this, these functions are like top forms on the, uh, in the, so phi plus is like a top form, phi minus is a top form. And yes. so, uh, isn't the wedge product automatically zero? Yes, you're jumping ahead. I, wonderful right, question. Okay, 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 okay. We'll answer it in one minute. Okay. okay. Um, so, uh, before doing so, uh, let me let me just mention quickly that you might wonder, you know, these kind of integrals come from some wall sheet action, and then you can play with them. You can wonder what where these come, where do these come from? Is there some kind of action? And um, I just wanted to mention it because it sort of remains an open problem whether there exists a consistent worksheet formulation um, of such intersection numbers. And uh, it seems like currently the answer is no, but there's a lot of progress by people like Siegel, Yusinskas, as Azevedo, Kasari, Turkin, under various different names. So they call it either Cairo strings, sexualized strings, or twisted strings, in which similar type of um, objects appear, but so far there's no single action that would land you on this object directly. Very good. So now let's go back to the question that Pata was just asking. Uh, the question is, well, how on earth is this just, is this even well defined? So let's look at the definition. In the definition, we have the wedge product of two top holomorphic forms. So if we're in one dimension, that means that both of them are proportional to dz. And famously, dz, wedge dz, is zero. So you might wonder, wow, okay, is this, is this just zero? And the answer is, well, it is zero in the bulk of the modulized space. So let me just uh, look at the modulized space. And by the bulk, I mean, places here in gray, which are away from the boundaries, okay? So it's indeed true that in the bulk, this thing will be zero and there's no problem with integration. So it gives me zero from, from these gray regions. However, close to the boundary, there will be a zero over zero type of problem. And the problem is that on the one hand, I get these things wedged to zero but on the other hand, the moduli space, I should have said this, that MO4 is non-compact. So but the way you might think of it is that the integration diverges close to the boundaries at the same time as uh, this being zero. So we, there's, there's a kind of a problem that we need to regularize. However, that's a very good sign. So let me emphasize this but because this is the first sign of localization. 
okay? So it says that once we do regularize this zero over zero problem, the integral will only receive contributions from the three points, the boundary points, zero, one, and infinity, okay? That's because, is there a, that's because, um, that's because the integrals in the bulk will be exactly zero. So the only thing that will contribute is these neighborhoods of the, of the boundaries. Was there a question? No. So, um, so uh, let, me, let me emphasize that these neighborhoods of these boundaries are exactly where the world sheet corresponds to places on the world sheet where, sorry, can you, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, there we go. I think it froze for a bit. Um, the, these are the places in the boundary. So, for example, the neighborhood where z goes to zero corresponds to s channel factorizations of the world sheet, where z goes to one corresponds to t channel factorizations, and z goes to infinity are u channel factorizations. So, these already look like Feynman diagrams. So, that's at least the plausibility argument why these kind of integrals defined, uh, defined above will give us something that looks more like a QFT rather than a string theory, even though it comes from a world sheet. Okay. Sorry, can so, I ask another question? Absolutely. The zero, one, and infinity were actually not in the forms of phi, right? The zero, one, and infinity were in the sort of Keller kind of thing, W, right? So, uh, so the way the one example of the way you can think about phi, and that's the example that we'll employ in a second as well, is that oh, it was something like this. So it has a pole at zero and pole at one, and it, it doesn't have any poles at infinity. Okay, so W doesn't play any role in this story. Oh, sorry, uh, W. Uh, yes, so W W was the one that was branched. Um, that is no longer w. involved. Yes. But W, the, okay, so maybe I should have emphasized, let me, let me go back here. I should have emphasized that w, w is given here, but the W itself doesn't appear in my formalism because all I did it was define this covariant derivative, which was twisted by D of W. And D of W by itself is single valued. So that easy. So that doesn't cause any problems. But but it's true that the DW has poles at zero, one, and the one that you cannot see at infinity. Yeah. Uh, and that, that effectively dictates where the boundaries could potentially be. And you see already that the, the boundary uh, where z goes to zero somehow would be tied to the S channel. Boundary around one will be tied to the T channel and the one at infinity to the U. Okay, does it does it answer your question? Yes. Okay, very good. So now that that um, we are confident that it's important to study this question, let me just do this regularization. Okay, so the regularization will be extremely simple. What we'll exploit is the fact that these, these cohomology classes, um, so the phi plus being equivalent to anything shifted by, by this nabla, um, that they're all equivalent and the choosing any psi doesn't change the answer. So we'll make use of this fact to cook up a specific psi that will make the integrand vanish close to the boundaries. Okay, so what I mean is that I will look at these red regions, which are some epsilon neighborhoods of each boundary. And what I want to do is cook up some new form, which will be completely zero in this neighborhood. And that would mean that there will be no ambiguities about integrations whatsoever. Okay, let's do it. What I'm going to do it is just, uh, well, the way that I'm going to do it is just show you the answer. Okay, so this will be the regularized, I should have said it. This is the, the regularized version. Phi plus C will be equal to the original one minus nabla of something. So this is my xi. And the way that I'm going to choose my xi is as follows. So I'm going to put a sum over all boundary points, P, 0, 1, infinity. And inside of this sum, I will put here a step function 
So that's a step function, which is equal to exactly one in the neighborhood of each point and zero on the outside. So I do it around point one, zero, one, and infinity. So I have these step functions. And here I also insert a formal inverse of my nabla derivative acting on my original form. Okay, it's just, a, just something that I cook up. Now let's see where, where it goes. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, collect some of the terms. So in the first line here, I have phi plus c times one, okay? So this is just copying this term. Then I'm going to look at what happens when this nabla hits this inverse. So they will just annihilate each other. They will, that will leave me with phi plus. So I just copied it in, in here. And I have the sum over the step functions, okay? The only remaining term is when nabla hits where the derivative hits the step function, but a step func the derivative acting on a step function is just going to be a, um, a Dirac delta. So I had a step function that was localized here. So derivative acting on it will give me something like a delta function on a circle here, circle here, and a circle here. Okay, so that's, that's this part. So that was this. And then I, what remains is this inverse of the, of the derivative acting on phi plus. So um, the, the, the only thing that I wanted to emphasize at this stage is that this delta function is non-holomorphic, which will play some role in a second. But let me summarize what we've done. What we've done is we achieved our goal because the, the, this regularized phi plus vanishes inside of every epsilon neighborhood of each boundary. This is because this term is just one minus these step functions. So it's obviously zero, it's obviously zero inside of the circles. And this term is just localized on the, um, on the, on the circles. So it's also zero inside of the neighborhood. Okay, so we achieved our goal and everything is safe. So now what we can do is go ahead and compute. So this is just copying the definition from before. We have this intersection number between phi minus and phi plus. And the way it was defined is, um, is by a wedge product. And now I will just replace this form with an equivalent one, but the regularized version. Sorry, let me just hide it. And um, I will include this normalization factor, which doesn't matter ultimately, it's just to make the final answer easier. So just cancel some factors of two pi i. Okay, now what I, what I can do is look at this phi plus c, which is given here. And what I want to do it is wedge it with phi minus. But we already know that that wedged with that is going to be zero. So that means that this term doesn't contribute at all. The only thing that will contribute are these delta functions. Okay, so let me just copy it in. So I'm just plugging that into here. Um, the, there's a question, but I will uh, answer it in a second. Um, so what happens is that I have this minus, it cancels this minus, and then I have a sum over now localization on the circles. So these are these delta functions. And I have phi minus, just copied from here, and this term copied to here. And obviously that integral is one over two pi i of something around the circle. So that's just a residue. So what, what I ended up uh, with in the end is a sum over three points, zero, one, infinity. And for each of them, I take a residue around the corresponding point of this combination of my original phi minus, phi plus, with this inverse derivative squished in the middle. And of course, that's just a finite sum. And that's exactly the type of localization that I was promising you at the beginning of the talk, uh, where the original integral collapsed to a finite sum of simpler objects. Um, so maybe at this stage, I should answer, there was a question. 
Hmm. So the the question Akash is asking, do we need to regularize phi minus? And the answer is no, because basically uh, what we have here is some multiplying two differential forms. So it's enough that one of them vanishes in the in this neighborhood, and then the full integrand is already regularized because we multiply something that is zero here with whatever, and that's that's enough. So of course, an alternative um, alternative regularization would be to do exactly the same, but for phi minus instead of phi plus, or you can in principle regularize both, but it's not going to buy you anything. So it's going to give you the same final formula. So I just did the minimal minimal regularization I needed. And then Chi is asking um, why the regularization is safe. It seems that phi can be regularized to be zero if we choose uh, psi. Oh, I see. Mm. Right, the, the, okay, I can go into details about this. The, 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 the reason, so what, uh, what she's asking is why, why didn't we, I mean, could we not have ignored this factor and then we would have phi plus minus phi plus and that's obviously illegal. And the reason why it's illegal is that we there's some conditions on my side that I didn't spell out for simplicity, but there should be there. And the uh, the the conditions is that the psi shouldn't be cohomologically trivial, which is what would happen if I just stick stick in this factor. Uh, another way of saying is that the the solution of this differential equation that I need to do to solve here, something that we will do in a second doesn't exist globally it only exists locally in some in some um, in some neighborhood and once i multiply it by a step function that's essentially choosing this local uh, solutions if if i consider the, this globally then there would be a solution but it wouldn't be um, there wouldn't be a single valid solution this is essentially like a section of a KZ bundle, so yeah. Okay, let me move on. I'm already behind. So to get some intuition, let's just work out a specific example, okay? So the example will be our old friend. Let me choose my phi plus and phi minus to be the same and equal to this DZ with a single pole at zero and, and, and one. So that already tells me something interesting about this formula because I need to compute the residues and this object only has simple poles. So that has simple poles. So that means that I need only to find this combination to a constant term. Everything else is meaningless because I compute the residue in the end. So only simple poles matter. Okay, so I need to compute this combination, which let me just denote it I, as psi p. I need to compute it locally uh, around each point P. And that essentially is just, if I, if I move this nabla to the other side, which, which is what I'm doing here, this is just solving a differential equation locally. Okay, so let me do it. So I have this differential equation. This nabla was just D plus alpha prime does times this combination. And then I can expand this psi to leading order plus subleading plus dot dot dot. And I already said that for the purposes of the residue, I only need this constant term. The, the, only, the other things won't matter. Okay, so that on the other side, if I look at the phi plus, this has a simple pole at zero. So locally it looks like dz over z. So the only thing that I need to look at to solve this equation for, for this phi zero zero is to look at the singularity, okay? So this is one over Z and I have alpha prime times S 
divided by z times this on the other side. So that tells me that the solution is uniquely that, one over alpha prime s. And you can, you can repeat similar exercises around points p equals one and p equals infinity. And in this case, you would get minus one over alpha prime t. And in this case, it would get zero, which is essentially a consequence of the fact that our form had a pole with residue one at zero, pole with residue minus one at one, and no poles at infinity. Okay, so once we've solved this, we can compute our amplitude. So it was an intersection number of this form and then of this form. And now the first term, so I'm just plugging it into this definition of this result. So we have residue around zero of my form phi minus times this guy that we just computed. So that obviously just gives me one over alpha prime s. And I have a very similar factor of one over alpha prime t coming from the residue at one. And obviously that's just one over alpha prime, one over s plus one over t, which is the simplest amplitude that you can compute, which is that of planar phi cube theory. Okay, so um, at some point I was planning to mention the, the connection to color kinematics duality. So if you, if you want to, I can explain it at the end, but in the interest of time, I wanted to move on. And the thing that I wanted to move on to is that the case of massless theories. Okay, so that was one of the examples that we computed here. That was a planar, I should have said massless phi cube theory. And there's something special about it. And the thing that is special is that the alpha prime here just goes outside, okay? So everything is homogeneous in alpha prime, okay? That actually happens for all massless theories in this formalism. And we can use this fact to our advantage. So since alpha prime goes outside, we might as well take the opposite limit because we just rescale the, the amplitude by some factor. It doesn't matter which way we do it. But what will happen is that it will give us different representation of the same object, even though, um, even though the computation will be different. Okay, so let me look at naively at this, at this factor that we've been playing with, nabla inverse. Okay, so that was the definition and I take the inverse and there was a single alpha prime in here. So you see very naively, if I just take alpha prime to infinity, it means that this factor dominates and roughly the way that this nabla inverse behaves is like one over alpha prime times this sz, tz minus one this factor here, okay? So let's just plug it in, okay? So I, I just plugged in to the previous definition. I have my phi plus and phi minus, and this nabla inverse, which used to be in between, now is just a number, so it's something like that. Um, and that, in principle, there could be some subleading corrections, okay? So let me look at this leading, leading term which we know that if we are in massive theories, uh, massless theories, then this would be absent in massless theories. Okay, so now a special thing that happens is that now this integrand, this, this, this uh, argument of the residue is completely independent of P which wasn't the case before. Now is the case that it doesn't matter which point you take, we have the same, same function here, the same one form, okay? So what this means is that now we can play with deforming the contours, okay? So here the sum goes over residues around zero, one, infinity. So that, that, and that thing. And what I can do is now I have a new pole of my integrand the value of the solution of this equation. So what I can do is just de deform the original contour to the contour around this, the solution of this equation, okay? So what I will get, and I think I forgot the minus sign, what I will get is 
um, another example of localization, which now, instead of localizing on three points, localizes on a single point, which is, was the solution of this equation. And of course, to those of you familiar with the scattering amplitudes literature, you would rec recognize this as the simplest example of scattering equations, which more generally look like this. So th these are the constraints that we've seen of, of CHY that we've seen um, in the, the motivation part. And that gives us yet another example of localization. Now, instead of the boundaries of the moduli space, now on the support of scattering equations. And that's the part that I wanted to, in the next part of the talk, focus on generalizing to ADS. So before doing so, let me pause and ask for any questions that you might have around uh, about this part. Any questions? So the, the DC in the denominator is really an operator. It's really a wedge, right? Sorry, well, yeah, what I meant, this is, this is more of a, what, what I mean is that, I mean, I'm just using this thing. Okay. Just, this is just a notation. I, I do want to be to, yeah, yeah. See what I mean? Uh, Yes, this, so Akash is asking if this denominator is is uh, DW, and it is. Yes, this is the this is this is DW. So in general, in general, the way it would happen is that the localization on these points are always given by the critical points given by a simple single derivative of W, and these points are essentially the opposites, so like the poles of W. Okay. So in our in our previous example, the W was alpha prime S Z. So there, there's one set of points, which is that being equal to zero, which are the scattering equations. And there's another set of points where this diverges, which is zero, one, infinity. Okay. Does it answer your question? Okay, any other questions? So I'm, so I'm supposed to finish in like 15 minutes, is that right? Uh, you can go, go a bit over, I think it's fine. Uh, so uh, let me ask a quick question. Uh, does this localization to Feynman diagram um, extend to higher genus case? <laughs> um, well, the, the most honest answer is that we don't know. Well, okay. Well, if it, if it was just configuration spaces, then the answer is most likely yes. But th there's a problem with, um, I mean, the, the main problem would be with, um, with the tau integration. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. clear, because it's no longer a manifold, it's not clear how exactly to apply these techniques. That's why having a model, like a consistent model, from which we can derive this kind of actions would be very welcome because that would presumably teach us in the same way as ambit twister strings told us something about scattering equations at one loop. Um, the hope is that something similar would happen here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, hi, hi, Sebastian. So just one quick question. So so far you are looking at top forms, right? I mean, in the mm -hmm. 5 plus and 5 minus F. So is it possible that for some QFT amplitude you may need to look at uh, in you know, lower rank homology groups. Uh, I mean, so, uh, so a special thing. So basically, what we've been looking at is these um, these cohomology groups, which in general the, there were one forms in here, but general would be n minus three forms. Right. It would be defined on M O N, and right. they would be defined with these uh, sections of this, of this band. Sorry, as um, yeah, twisted by this bundle. Yes. So one thing you can show, you can actually ask a question about um, the existence of other, of the, yes. the whole ring, and that, that's what you're talking about. But the, the thing is that, the thing that happens is that the only, only star is equal to n minus three is non-vanishing. 
So that's that's a difference to usual cohomology groups with integer or say C coefficients, in which case there would be a whole tower of all cohomologies and you can pick different differential, differential forms. But what happens um, for these twisted ones is that once you impose the twist, there's only one cohomology group and it's always in this middle dimension. But that will depend on the twist, on the, on the W, I guess. I mean, in yeah, principle. So the, this, this W has to be W has to be generic now. It has to be a generic twist. Meaning, what what it means for our purposes is that the kinematics is generic. Like all Mandelstam invariants are independent, linearly independent of each other. If we were, for example, on some sitting on some factorization channel, then that would not be true. Yeah, I was wondering because if you take a generic scalar field amplitude, could it come from mm -hmm. this intersection number of top and cohomology groups, like phi to the fourth theory or something? Yeah, so you would like to, yeah, one, one I guess you, if you wanted to have something like phi to the four, then, then in principle, what you know is that some channels, you know, say S12 would never be allowed. So in principle, you can set it to zero. Right. Right? So yeah. and like all the other IJ. So that if you plug in that into the definition of your of your twist, then that, that statement is no longer true. So right. okay. It okay. would allow you for a possibility of lower forms and higher forms. And that would be actually right. a very interesting question. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Any last questions for this part? Okay, so let's move on to the ADS case, okay? But before doing so, it's very useful to review the endpoint formula using scattering equations. And the way they looks like is as follows, okay? So we have some integral over these, these scattering equation constraints. Um, it's a counter integral enclosing all of those. We have this phi plus and phi minus. In the denominator, as a generalization of what we had before, we had these um, scattering equations um, from before. And also, so obviously, selecting a given theory amounts to selecting a given phi plus and phi minus. And also, it's um, important to include this factor. So the whole formula wouldn't make sense unless we imposed momentum conservation. So let me just impose it here, OK? So I'm going to work in some Minkowski in d plus one dimension. Um, so the delta function can be alternatively written in the following way. It can be written as, a, as an overlap between plane waves, which meet at the single point some x in here. And then I just integrate over this point, okay? So that's just a contact diagram in Minkowski space, which is very boring because it's just a delta function but it will inspire some generalizations to ADS, okay? But um, before doing so, I need to introduce some notation what are now replacing the external data. So now we don't have momenta, we have something different. So let me just very briefly, since I'm running out of time, review it, okay? So this is given by the, the so-called embedding space formalism, okay? So usually, in the usual coordinates, we can write um, ADS in d plus one dimensions uh, with this metric. And then what embedding space formalism does is it embeds it into R uh, two comma D in the following way. Well, that's one way of realizing it. So that's some vector in R to the two D. And this parameterizes some hypersurface, which is given by this constraint the, this hyperbolic constraint, uh, x squared being equal to minus one. So the, this hypersurface defines the ADS. Now, what you can do, so these x's are basically the bulk, bulk coordinates, like here. And now you can do, um, ask yourself what, how do we represent boundary coordinates? And in, in, in this embedding space formalism, they would be related to the, to the usual uh, boundary coordinates x, uh, they would be packaged into this p vector, okay? And this p vector has 
a special property that it squares to zero and it's also projective. Okay, so if you know it, then then you know it. If you don't know it, then the picture is as follows. There's a there's some points in the bulk which are parameterized by these axes, and there's some points pictorially on the boundary. So let's say p1, p2, p3, and p4, which are the where the where the operators are that you want to scatter uh, where, where they're defined. Okay, so now the main advantage of using the embedding space formalism is now that the conformal group, which is SL2, D, acts linearly in these coordinates on X's and P's. Okay, so first of all, we can define these generators of the conformal group. So DI with the with the um, with the embedding space indices A and B will be just given by these contractions of P del P anti-symmetrized in A and B. Okay. Another ingredient that we will need is the Casimir. So Casimir is just the eigenvalue of the, of the square of the generator. And we know that it's always, it's proportional to the uh, delta, the conformal dimension times delta minus D. And what we'll need for, the, for our purposes, which is essentially the analog of masslessness condition, is that this Casimir is zero. So that will be solved by setting the conformal dimension to the space-time dimension of our, our manifold, D. Okay, and then the last ingredient that we need is the bulk to boundary propagator, which is the analog of the plane wave in the in flat space, which in, in this embedding space can be described very briefly as just x dot p for a given boundary point p. So I'm just talking about something like, like that. This is the bulk to boundary uh, propagator. And it's, it's, uh, it's given by this raised to the, the power delta, where delta is the conformal dimension. Very good. So now this gives us an obvious generalization from, of the flat space formula. Okay, the way that it looks like, let's say I wanted to compute some, some ADS amplitude at end point. Oops. The way it's going to, the way it's going to look like, sorry. Oh, there we go. The way it's going to look like is um, as before, we have phi minus, phi plus. Now we're going to have some modified scattering equations that I will explain in a second. Now, instead of the contact diagram that we had before, so before we had this, this diagram, which was just plane waves interacting at the contact point. Now I have just uh, bulk to boundary propagators interacting at the single boundary point as well. So that was the X. Okay. So the way it's given is by this expression integrated over all X points in ADS D plus one. Okay, so that's nothing but the contact diagram. Obviously now it's not no longer a single delta function. It's a more complicated object. So let me just, let me just leave it there. Okay. And now what generalizes the scattering equations from the previous slides are now a new type of operator valued scattering equations. Okay, they're denoted by E and they include contractions of my uh, conformal generators that we just defined a second ago. So they're now uh, P del P operators. Twice now the scattering equation is an operator uh, uh, as well, okay? And these operators here, formally inverted, will be acting on my contact diagram, which itself is a function of this piece, okay? Is that clear? So if it's clear, it might not be entirely obvious why that's a natural generalization, but I mean, obviously it is a generalization. The question is why would you expect that that's something that would collapse to a flat space limit in, um, uh, co sorry, collapse to the CHY formula in the flat space limit. So I'm not going to derive why that's true, but I'm going to give you at least a plausibility argument why you might expect that 
uh, this collapses correctly to the usual scattering equations in the flat space. Okay, so what, what I'm going to argue is that this D to D contractions acting on the contact diagram in, in ADS, in the flat space limit will act exactly like P dot P acting on a delta function. So this flat space limit will be given by um, the limit when all the conformal dimension become, dimensions become very large, going to infinity. So that, that part of the talk will be based on a paper which appeared um, yesterday by Komatsu, Paulos, Van Ries, and Zhao, um, which discusses this in much more detail. So I invite you to read it there if you're interested. Okay, so the way, the way we're going to do it is that we're going to start with our contact diagram, just the same thing as we had before, this thing. But now we write it as some, some kind of an action, okay? So the action will be a functional of x, and it's given just by, um, just by the usual bulk to boundary propagators, these logs. And also I wanted to um, impose that um, these x's are in the ADS hypersurface, in the embedding space. So in, impose using a Lagrange multiplier that x squared is equal to well, something that I used to set to minus one, now I, I set it for dimensional reasons to the radius of the ADS. Sorry, x squared has to be minus radius of the ADS squared. Good. So now what I can do is do our favorite game. We can employ the saddle point approximation. Okay, so we just look, look at our action. And then we just extra my, we just take the first derivative with respect to um, x. Okay, so we have this term, which is very easy because it just comes from the log. And we have this term, which is almost e also easy because it just comes from the Lagrange multiplier. And we know that this has to be equal to zero. Now, the thing that we can do is take this equation and contract it with x. So contracting this part with x will just give me n copies of deltas. And contracting this part with x will give me, whoops, um, this squared, okay, by the, by the Lagrange conditions. And this tells me the solution for the Lagrange multiplier, which, which is like this, okay? So now, and I think I messed up some squares in here, but it doesn't really matter that much. Now what we can do is now plug this thing into our cell point equations, and it gives us this constraint, okay? And what I'm going to claim following the, um, this paper is that this combination, we can treat it as some kind of a momentum. So I'm just going to call it P twiddle. Um, such that this sum is essentially momentum conservation in this space, okay? What you can show, at least if you're careful about the where to put the powers of error radius, is that the square of this is going to be proportional to delta divided by the ADS radius squared. So that's something that if we take the ADS radius to, va to go to infinity faster than the conformal dimensions will go to zero. So that's like the massless limit. Okay, so with this identification, what we can do is we can just look at our D dot D acting on the contact diagram. Then we localize on the cell point action and then see just how D dot D act on this, on this action. And what you will find is that it gives us this combination. And that combination turns out to be exactly the square of these momenta, like P, pi dot pj, twiddle twiddle, okay? And on the other hand, we know that this action, since we are on the saddle point, it has to be proportional, it has to be imposing these constraints. It has to be imposing that these p twiddles add up to zero. So that means that um, that has to be one way or another proportional to the delta function. 
So that's exactly what we wanted to show, uh, what we wanted to argue at this for, um, is that the, the D acting on the contact behaves in the same way as uh, P-twiddle, P-twiddle acting on a, on a point of constipation. Okay. So great. Now, now that we know that our formula at least has a chance of making sense, let's just compute something. Okay. So what we're going to compute is a four point amplitude in ADS, whereas before I'm going to use the gauge fixing, in which Z1 through Z4 are fixed to be zero Z1 infinity. And this differential form will be our favorite DZ with a polygon one. And what we have is that our formula, after we plug in this thing, and after we plug in the operator scaring equation, looks like uh, something with poles in here, one over the scaring equation, acting on the contact diagram represented with this cartoon. Okay. So now you can ask yourself, well, how exactly do we evaluate it? So essentially, there will be two different ways of computing the result. So the, the first way would be to decompose the integrand into the eigenvalues um, of the, into the eigenfunctions of the uh, scattering equation. So it's an operator, you can diagonalize it, you can expand it in in eigenbasis, and then you might hope that that will allow you to compute this. And that's in principle an option, although we don't, we, we haven't done this computation um, explicitly. And the reason for that is that there's a much simpler option. And that's something that I will do in this talk, which is to just use contour deformations. Okay, so here's how it works. It's actually entirely analogous to what we've seen before. So we have something in our in our integration space. We, we have poles at zero, one, infinity. And in principle, there could be many, many other points which are solutions of the discovery equations. And the original contour was the one around these solutions. So we can, of course, just deform it to enclose zero, one, infinity instead. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So I'm just copying this expression with a different contour. Okay. So you see now there is no problem with evaluating this expression because we just take residues around zero, one, infinity. So we know how to do it. There's no interference from any operator valuedness. Okay. So the way we do it, I mean, you can just compute it. So from zero, from zero, we get, we have a simple pole, which gives us just one over di, d1 to d2. From one, we get one over d2 to d3. And from infinity, we get nothing. And everything, of course, still acts on this contact diagram, which I just rewrote in here. Okay. So far, so good. So, we're not done yet because that's not an object that, that you would have seen in ADS books. So let's, let's just massage it to a form that might be more familiar. Okay. So in order to complete the derivation, what we need to see is how these objects, one over D to D, these things, how they can be converted to bulk to bulk propagators. Okay, so in order to see this, let me first um, see how how this a single conformal generator acts on the bulk to boundary propagator. Okay, so this D was just this um, anti-symmetrized version of P del P. Okay, so I just plugged in the definition here. And then you can see how th that this P, the way that it acts is that it gives us this result. Okay, so it just brings in power of x into the numerator and we contract it with p. And you see that at this stage, basically p and x are on the same footing. They're just anti-symmetric. 
So what we might have done as well is up to a factor of minus one is instead of hitting the original thing with D, we could have hit it with this nabla, which is the this differential operator, okay? Just with axis replacing the piece. Of course, this nabla is, is designed in such a way that nabla squared is nothing by the ADS Laplacian. And we know that that's something that we will need for the de definition of the bulk to bulk propagator. Okay. So now that we know how a single D uh, acts on, on bulk to boundary, we also know how D dot D contractions act on these terms. They just, we just apply the same derivation twice. And what we end up with is just the ADS Laplacian that D dot D acting on these terms is the same as Laplacian acting on, on the same terms, okay? And that's everything that we need to evaluate the first term, this term, in, in our ADS amplitude, okay? So the way we're going to write it is just, I'm going to rewrite what's written above. So just this term, that with that. We have one over d1 to d2, and I'm just going to do a going to do a trick in which I'm just going to insert a dummy delta function in some y, which splits it into p1, p2 parts interacting at x, and p3, p4 interacting at y. And in the next step, what I'm going to use is just use the same identity formally inverting this operator acting on this part. Okay, so that's the first step. I'm going to act on this part. It's going to give me something like one over Laplacian, and then I'm going to use integration by parts to move it here. So the expression that I end up with is something like this, where I, in, where I can recognize that one over the, by definition, one of the one over the Laplacian hitting a delta function is just the bulk to boundary propagator. Exactly what we want, what we're looking for. And on one side, I have P1 and P2 interacting at this X point. So these are these two terms. Then I have bulk to bulk connecting X and Y. And then I have these two parts, which are P3 and P4. And that's nothing else but a Witten diagram. So therefore we found by symmetry, you can repeat the same thing in the other channel. And what we found is that, is that the, our amplitude is exactly given as a sum over two width and diagrams, which is a ge direct generalization of what we've seen before for Feynman diagrams. So let me, uh, one second, let me, just, let me just mention that the higher point generalizations of this, of this uh, theory for the case of the biojoint scalar at least have been worked out in this paper with Eberhardt and Komatsu. And also there's some interesting computations in the gravitational sector done by uh, Roering and Skinner in the paper that appeared on the same day. So maybe that's a good time to ask for some questions. So there's a question from uh, Hang Yu Chen. Oh, hi, yeah, hi, this is Hang Yu Chen. I'm Yuting's colleague at Taiwan. So uh, one quick question. So are those, all this field are massless right now? Are all this delta should be D in your formalism? Yes. I see. So, so is that, you know, this calculation quite restricted in, in this sense? You can only deal with the massless uh, fields in ADS. Is there any way to, but normally in ADS CFD, we we'll think about generic uh, yeah. deltas, right? So. Yeah. so right now, at least in this first paper on scalar correlators, we only treated the case delta equals to D with massless. Um, uh -huh. uh, because the, the reason for that is of course that the formula, the CHY formula in flat space also works the best or mostly in the flat space, uh, sorry, the massless limit. Um, so we just wanted to mimic that. It's of course a very interesting question how to... Um, oh, okay, well, the reason why I'm asking this is that usually yeah. 
right, okay, in the, in the actual, say, full ADS by times SY calculation, you are yep. looking at the supergravity mode. Indeed, it's massless in the 10 dimensional sense. But yep. then it's after you do the KK reduction along the S5, yep. then you can actually have some massive uh, feel uh, yep. living in the ADS, then you have exactly. all the subsequent calculation. So this, this formula isn't generalized in the full, because you are in your paper and in this talk, you only focus on the ADS part. Uh, yep. Can you actually generalize to the full, say, stream backgrounds? And then, yeah, that, then that, cook, cook, out, cook out a massive field in the after compatibilization. Yeah, that that that's exactly one of the things that we're thinking about now. For example, how to do it in the case of say ADS five cross S S five, mm -hmm. in which you can now include the KK modes, and it, this would give you some kind of masses. It's not, it's still not clear how to do it, but we're thinking about those questions. I see, but you think this is consistent with the. The, 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 the MB twister formalism? Well, I should say that, um, that um, so I haven't mentioned the MB twister formalism here at all. There's basically mm -hmm. two constructions. The first mm -hmm. one is the one that we provided. The other one uh, was by Roaring Skinner. So Roaring mm -hmm. Skinner considered specifically ADS3 cross S3 right. with uh, type two backgrounds. Okay. Uh, but what we did was to consider generic ADSD, mm -hmm. um, possibly ADSD across some compact directions. Right. Uh, but in this case, it turns out that the theory, the, the ambitwister theory, is anomalous. So mm -hmm. There's some anomalies that you cannot cancel in any dimension. Right. Uh, but if you consider, um, if you consider classical limit, which we define to be in some scaling limit of the um, um, ratio of the uh, string scale to ADS scale, if you take that to be small, then the anomalies don't play any role. So this is basically a BRST anomaly, right? It, it, it's a BRST anomaly, yeah. There's, okay. there's so you're saying that the tree level, this is preserved. This is okay. Right. Uh, no, not exactly. What I, I said see. is that, uh, what I said is that even at tree level, you have to consider the classical limit. I see. But this still, this, this anomaly does not affect your, uh, to define the twisted cohomology to do the localization computation? Yeah, the localization, yeah, so exactly. That's, that's um, one point of view, which is the one that might be preferred by many, is mm -hmm. that, is that um, you just tra trade the, sorry, you treat the, the, um, the ambitwister action as some kind of motivation, but then once you derive this formula, you just don't care, and then you just play with this formula and play with different integrands. What what kind of theories you can you can have? Um, so that would be that would be one approach. Just forget about where it comes from. Forget about any anomalies. After all, we actually proved to arbitrary multiplicity that this formula reproduces correct within diagrams in this specific theory for scalars. Um, so it's correct and you can, you can use it. But I think to, 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 to extend this to a kind of more generic ADS CFD setting, you still need to somehow answer this question. Like for example, the mass, massive case we were talking about earlier. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's finish the talk first. Yeah, then we can yeah, probably sure. discuss more. Thanks. Well, I, I only had a summary Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry, Sebastian, since you mentioned you check to endpoints, so can you actually work uh, like backwards? Like if you first write down the Witten diagram here and then try to, uh, I mean, it, it seems that the contour deformation part of the, so the, the Z part doesn't really need to know uh, if you are doing flat space or Witten diagram. Is that true? Uh, for the scalar, so case, I can formally, yeah. In in your in your in, in your case of, I, I guess you are do, really doing by join phi cube in ADS, right? Yes, yes. So I could just formally replace every uh, d by this p tilde, and then just uh, is that true? So I I mean the the the, the technically all the z integral part is as if they are in flat space, or is there yes. some subtlety to this? Uh, there is a there is a subtlety. Well, okay. the, the subtlety you don't see very well at four point. Uh -huh. But the subtlety is that this d dot d's they don't commute by themselves, so it's not we we shouldn't manipulate them as. as ah, I see. 
a mute. What, what you can show is that um, the scattering collisions here, these do commute, is, which is actually the reason why you can diagonalize them simultaneously. Right, so right. Uh, but but um, you have to be more careful at higher points that you don't uh, trick yourself into sometimes interchanging D to D. So that right, you, I you see. Need to, yeah, need to remember. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so in the last um, in the last five minutes, what I'm going to do is just summarize, scroll through the slides and recap everything that we've done so far. Okay, so what we've done is we started with this question about um, localization, which was something that was supposed to be a property of quantum field theory, which reduces an infinite dimensional integral to a finite sum. Okay. Then we considered it in three different um, um, settings. The first one was the Grossman the, reviewing the Grossman the limit. Then there was reviewing the uh, Feynman diagram localization and the and the scattering equations generalization. And we um, um, also discussed the generalization to ADS uh, in terms of Witten diagrams as well as these operator valued scattering equations. Okay. So what we've done for the for the Grossman the limit, the crucial point here was that we, we analyzed the existence of Stokes phenomenon in this um, kinematic space, which is a phenomenon that in different directions you encounter different types of asymptotics. And what we focused on is the asymptotics in this in this physical region, which is the one that we we care about. And what we found after analyzing all the details about the sheet structure of our integrand, that it can be expressed as the usual universal suppression times this, um, times this oscillating factor with infinite number of poles. Okay. Then we moved on to asking a question about uh, what, uh, what kind of other objects we can define using these cohomology classes. Two of them were string theory amplitudes, and then we focused on the one which is a bit more new, which is which were the formulation of QFT amplitudes as intersection numbers of differential forms. Okay. Then what we found is that there exists a localization on um, on in infinitesimal neighborhoods of each boundary, and localization was given by this this simple formula. Then we've learned how to use this simple formula and computed some examples of intersection numbers, which we found to be corresponding to QFT amplitudes in some simple cases. Then what we found finally was, was a connection to the alpha prime going to infinity limit in which there was another type of localization, which was the, the one on the scattering equations uh, given here. Finally, that was partly an inspiration for the generalization to ADS, in which we started with the CHY formula in flat space and basically upgraded it to a CHY formula in ADS space, where the role of the momentum conservation is now played by a contact diagram, and the role of the previous scattering equations is played by the operator valued scattering equations. We gave some evidence why this is supposed to be a correct generalization. And finally, we did an explicit computation, which shows that, in, at least in this four point case, we landed on the correct width and diagrams for the ADS uh, biogen scalar. So, with that, let me just thank you and open the floor for any discussions. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank Sebastian for this wonderful talk. Uh, in view of time, maybe we can just do a few quick questions. Can I answer a question? Sure. Uh, do the solutions to the scattering equations on both sides match, meaning from the ADS space and the flat space limit? Like, uh, do they also have n minus three factorial number of solutions? No, so, um, well, so in principle, 
we shouldn't so I didn't say anything about it. Um, in principle, we shouldn't assume anything about the number or place like where these solutions are. So there could be many solutions, but the, for the purposes of the control deformation argument, it didn't matter where they are, what they are, how many. Um, it just matter that the, the, where the positions of the other poles are, okay? However, in this paper of, um, uh, Rorick and Skinner, they argue that the number of solutions after you diagonalize the system, that the number of solutions should be the same as in flat space. Okay. And uh, like uh, soft limits and etc. the factorizations can also be studied uh, in the ADS case because the soft limit itself is uh, started in the ADS case, I think. Yeah, it's it's not clear. Well, it depends what you mean by exactly by the soft limit. Um, uh, meaning of, uh, um, ma uh, they are not ma massless, right? The fields uh, in the, the area field, space. The fields are massless. In our case, they're they're massless. If you're asking, can we? If they take the p going to zero. That. Yeah. So unfortunately, now the. Um, I guess what you would be asking is about some kind of D going to zero limits, which doesn't really make much physical sense. So I don't know what, what kind of sense it means, uh, it has. Um, there's, uh, of course, other types of taking the, the um, f um, soft limit in ADS, but they would be usually involving integrating some currents on the, on the boundary. Uh, so we, we, haven't, we haven't really studied those yet. Uh, the, the, as for the factorization structure, is essentially fixed by similar argument. Well, basically, it's fixed by factorization structure of the wall sheets. So very similar to what happens in um, in flat space. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Can I ask a question? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So. Uh, so what what are we really computing? I mean, okay, my question is that, for example, the final result in the, the last few slides is just repro reproducing the Witten diagram from this uh, from this Walsh formalism. Is that right, or does it actually offer some real advantage of like if I just really want to compute some scattering process in there? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, so, you, so you might have a valid complaint that uh, in for Skinner's, it of course didn't buy us anything because we just did another found another way of doing the same computation, mm. and it's sort of, it's sort of arguable whether that computation was easier or, or more difficult. Um, but what we are hoping for is that um, you, if we manage to generalize it to spinning correlators, then that might offer some advantages um, uh, compared to the usual techniques, such as the melding space or, or, or position space within diagrams. I see, so you need to somehow generalize your derivation of the vertex operator to the spin, to include the spin yeah. as well. Yeah. And there are actually some, I mean, a lot of progress for the in the gravitational sector has been done in this, in this paper, okay. although they didn't compute Anything beyond the free point function, I think. I see. Uh, and there's, there's also a general question because I'm really novice to this game. This might be very ignorant. But uh, so usually when we think about localization, which has been, you know, used widely in a different context, well, namely doing the supersymmetric uh, gauge mm -hmm. theory or you know, partition function computation, so on, on curve manifold, then they rely very much on the existence of an action for a given theory. And then you can define the appropriate cohomology, the Q is that cohomology out of those actions. Mm -hmm. And then you classify the solution uh, of those, uh, uh, well, basically solve the, the, the Q is this condition with some epsilon parameter turning on. Um, so for example, in the context of ADS calculation, or just even this flat space in general, is it always guaranteed, can, can, can one, what is it an analog of the, the action that you can write down for arbitrary number of points in such a way that you can, yeah, just define those, because uh, you define those delta dw, right? And are those uh, kind of independent from what kind of, how many points of the, 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 the correlation function is the compute or what kind of background you want to 
want to do. Mm -hmm. So, oh, um, so maybe let me answer this question first in flat space, in which okay. case the relevant action that you're asking about is the ambit twister action. Okay. Um, and what you can show is that it does localize um, mm -hmm. uh, on, on, on the world sheet, but the mm -hmm. arguments that go into that are different to the arguments that enter supersymmetric localization. Oh, I see. So what's the difference? Uh, the, 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 the way... Um, Okay. No. What do I um? Uh, well, the way the way you would see it from the Umbridge with twister action is that there is some field on the world sheet, mm -hmm. which uh, which we know we have to impose its massless and um, uh, and vanishing, and that vanishing of that uh, field or square of that field is equivalent to imposing scattering equations. So we know that it it guarantees to land us on a uh, dimension zero locus of um, um, on the on the moduli space, which is essentially the same as uh, imposing scattering equations. So the, in the the um, as far as I know, there's no direct connection to supersymmetric localization. I see. Mm -hmm. So how about in the case of <laughs> ADS? I can refer you to. Um, if you want to know more about flat space, there, there's a there's a paper by. Um, uh, Skinner and Mason around 2013. I mean, their original mm -hmm. MB2 stepping class. Yes. Yeah. Um, in the in the um, in the curved space, there's essentially very similar arguments. The way the way that it's generalized in this paper of Rowing and Skinner is that they consider um, the ambitwister action not in Minkowski space but on a group manifold. So you can treat um, you can treat um, um, ADS three cross S three as uh, SL two R, mm -hmm. and that's a group manifold. So you write your action on that group manifold, and there's a very similar localization argument there. What we did is do, do a very similar thing, not on a group manifold, but on a coset space. So if you treat ADS cross some internal directions of coset space, you can also do localization there. But it's of the same type as localization in flat space. I see. So right now, most of the calculation are done on a sphere. And uh, you were saying there's some difficulty generalized on the Riemann surfaces to define the cohomologies uh, or? Yes, so uh, once again, this is has been developed over the last seven years or so in flat space. And one of the results is that um, there's an additional localization on the moduli spaces um, of hygienous surfaces, which localize even the tau modulus, like let's say on a, on a torus, they would localize the tau modulus to I infinity, which means that topologically it's um, the, the integration, the world sheet that you have to integrate over, that would be equivalent to spheres with some um, uh, points identified. Oh, I see. Okay. So basically, Thanks. all the computations that people do always boil down to some version of uh, sphere integrals with obviously a lot of subtleties. Okay, thank you. Any other quick question? If not, let's thank Sebastian again for the beautiful talk. Yeah. That was very nice. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.